Welcome to another live Dr. B Music Theory. I have, uh, I'm going to be looking here to my right so to make sure I can see everything that's going on and keep up with, with the, uh, the stream. Uh, so please forgive me if, as I get everything set up here. So welcome, welcome. It's good to, to have, have some people here. I know they're going to be checking in as things um, get, really get started. So what I would like you to keep in mind is, and, and this is going to be archived on my YouTube channel, so for those of you who who don't get to see it live, uh, it's, it's going to be there for you. And for those of you who want to review anything, uh, it can be here. So what I normally do, and I'm, I'm saying this now to just the, the people who are watching from the archive, what I do is I have a Patreon channel where people can support me. And if you support me at $5 a month or more, uh, I give advance notice on when I have these live Q&As. And I also allow uh, my supporters to submit any kind of questions they might have and they can go to the top of the list of things that I'll be answering in one of these live Q&As. So if you want to know when these are going to happen and you want to be able to submit questions ahead of time, go over to Patreon, subscribe, uh, give, me, give, me, give me $5 a month and you will be able to do that. If that doesn't work for you, that's no problem. I don't have, uh, that's, that's not an issue for me. You'll, you'll be able to uh, kind of keep, make sure that you're subscribed to my YouTube channel. Make sure you click the little bell so you get notifications when I go live and things like that. Um, and you should be able to, uh, to follow along and ask, ask questions in the chat. So what I would like to do to start uh, is say, uh, welcome, it's been a while. My last live video was in January and a lot has happened since January for all of us. Uh, and, and so the end of the academic year, it's, it's, it's done. I wrapped things up a couple weeks ago. And so now I have some time and some attention and brain space to come back to what I really love to talk about, which is music theory. So I had a question from a student uh, who is studying for their ABRSM, which I kind of vaguely had an idea that that was some kind of test that they do over in the United Kingdom and England and in London for the Royal Academy of Music and some other schools, uh, and that there was these graded levels. And I've had more than one person write to me that they've been using my videos, my lessons that are online, to help them study, to review, and prepare for these examinations. So I, I looked it up because I, you know, I, I'm here in the United States and, and I just really wasn't quite sure. And the website is actually really kind of useful. Even if you're not going to be taking an exam for the Royal Academy of Music, they kind of list everything by level for music theory along with other things like oral skills and ear training and instruments and piano. They have like these syllabi on what are the expectations. So if you're someone who's teaching yourself how to play piano, music theory, whatever it is that you're trying to learn musically, and you want to kind of gauge what you should be studying and in what order, you can go to their website and it actually lays things out really neatly. They have some videos, they have some PDFs you can download. So I just wanted to, before I got started, uh, I wanted to kind of like read for you what I printed out. So they have theory grade one. So at grade one, what they're going to test you on and what they want you to know are things like the note values. So they have the semi-brev, minimum, crochet, quaver, and mini-quaver, which is another way of saying and things like whole note, half note. And you can and they say that you can use the equip you can use what you know, use the terms whole notes, half notes, however you want. Um, so I don't really I have never really talked about the diff, you know what the semi-brev, the minimum. Minimum. You can look that up on Wikipedia. Maybe I'll do a, a talk about that. I would have to brush up myself just to make sure I have them all straight. But they, they, they relate to the different note values. So you got to know your note values. You got to know about tied notes, single dotted notes and rests. You need to know about number two on the list, simple time signatures like two, four, three, four, and four, four. You need to know about bar lines and the grouping of notes listed above within these times. Number three, the stave or the staff, uh, so treble clef, G clef, the bass clef, F clef, names of notes on the stave, including middle C on both clefs, sharp, flat, natural signs, and their cancellation. So this is stuff that I cover in my music theory uh, within the first couple of lessons. 
Uh, number four, still this is for grade one, construction of the major scale, including the positions of the tones and semitones, scales and key signatures of the major keys of C, G, D, and F in both clefs, and their tonic triads, root position, degrees, numbers only, number only, and intervals above the tonic by number only. So I'm not talking about major, minor, augmented, diminished, but just the number interval, a third, a fourth, a fifth. And then finally, the fifth thing they want you to know for grade one is some frequently used terms and signs concerning tempo, dynamics, performance directions, and articulation marks. Simple questions will be asked about a melody written in either treble or bass clef. That's actually something that I normally don't cover in my music theory class, talking about tempo, dynamics, performance directions. So it's useful, and I, I urge you, those of you who are teaching yourself music theory or reviewing, to go to the ABRSM website. Just It'll pop up, Royal Academy of Music, London, uh, and it does some other, other schools of music. And kind of look at that, and you can kind of see what areas. And so for me, you know, I printed out the whole, you know, that there's, there's a, you know, grade one all the way through grade eight. And I printed it out here, and I'm not going to read it all to you, but I'm going to go through these. And there might be certain topics that I, you know, that I might want to fill in that I didn't cover, that I skipped over, like I just mentioned, the, the performance directions and articulation and these types of things that... You know, from, from textbook to textbook, from teacher to teacher, there's going to be some variations on what they emphasize and what they cover. Uh, and I've mentioned this before, certain schools will teach species counterpoint right off the bat, and others save it all the way to graduate work, um, so, so much, much later. And, and some, some, some schools, some uh, teachers are going to emphasize different things. And as a, a scholar of music, like you, you, you yourself are, you're going to want to know a little bit of everything because it's all important knowledge. So this this comes from um, uh, this question came from someone who was going for grade six, and the question uh, what had to do with this melodic beginning of this melody that I wrote up here on the board. And so it, the, the directions, and I'm going to read them to you. Say continue this opening to form a complete melody for unaccompanied clarinet at concert pitch. It should end with a modulation to the relative minor. Okay, so I'm gonna write that down here. Relative minor modulation. So this, this question is again uh, for grade six. So they're assuming you know a lot of stuff at this point, right? Like you gotta know how to modulate, you got to know what the relative minor is. Uh, these are important concepts. Uh, for those of you watching who, who, who don't know those things, I have my lessons. You can kind of look at them. The covers modulation, talks about relative minor. And you can kind of like, you know, go look at that for a little bit, come back when I maybe answer a question in 10, 15 minutes. That's, that's at whatever level. So this information is good. And even if you don't understand everything, you can kind of understand or get a sense of the the questions that need to be asked so that when you're studying the more basic stuff like relative minor you can kind of have an eye towards why you need to know this information how is this information going to be useful and that might help you keep motivated to keep learning so I'm going to repeat that it should end with a modulation to the relative minor and should be between 8 and 10 bars long so I'm going to write that down 8 to 10 bars now Following directions is always important. Uh, one thing is to know content. That's, that's step one. Step two is follow the directions from the teacher or the test that you are being asked. Don't get fancy. Follow the directions. So we're gonna help, I'm going to help you with both of those things. And then lastly, it says add performance directions as appropriate and write the complete melody on the staves below. So let me kind of go through, and I made a kind of a step-by-step -step process on how I would do this. Because you know me, I love my step-by-step -step, step process where it's like step one. The whole idea is to make it as easy as possible. And so if you do step one, step two shouldn't confuse you. But if you maybe try to jump straight to step two without doing step one, that's when confusion happens. All right? So step one, here's what I say. Measure one, and this is measure one right here. 
Use what is given. You'd be amazed. Some people will change the given. And, there, and, the, and, the, and the question says, continue this opening. It doesn't say change it. And people will be like, oh, but I thought I would like want to do this, something to make it a little more special. No, don't do that. You're taking a test. You're showing that you know knowledge. You're not demonstrating that you're an amazing composer. You're demonstrating knowledge of a subject. So, measure one, use what is given. Good, right? Measure two, complete the measure if needed. Um, so here we have beat one, two, and actually they wrote it like this with an eighth note there. So they give us two and a half beats. So we're going to have to complete this measure, all right? So what, what, what I did, and I kind of did this exercise this morning when I woke up just to get prepared for this video, is I, I kind of cheated in the sense that I used a piano to help check myself. Now, depending on the way the test is administered, you might not be able to use a piano. So what I'm doing by using a piano is I'm also using my ear. Having listened to lots of music by Haydn and other composers like him, I can use my ear to be like, oh, that sounds like a good melody. If you don't have access to a piano, let's say you're in a more traditional classroom setting where you just got to be sitting at a desk quietly, you need to sing the melody in your head. And this is where your ear training classes and exercises should help you. Or, you know, pretend you're playing a piano if that helps you. Or play, you know, do like air guitar or air piano or whatever it is that you're comfortable with. And try to figure out what that melody is. So you might say, okay, I, I just need to try to sing this melody and, and, and get a sense of what it is. So you know what you're starting with, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and give myself the pitch. But you can start on any note. And, and you know this is in the key. So if you look at this... I mean, I'm almost getting ahead of myself already. Look at this. I have to say, well, what key is this in? With one sharp, it's either in G major or E minor. Since they're telling me to modulate to the relative minor, that means we're starting in G major. And this, this is right here is a G major triad, B, D, G, B, D, G. It's all just an arpeggio. So we're definitely starting here. If I were to do a Roman numeral analysis, which they're not asking for, but I might write it in for my own purposes, Roman numeral one. I know that's a one chord. So even if you don't know the right B, you can kind of like be like, do, mi, so, mi, do, mi. And then just try to sing it to yourself, right? So you go, mi, so, do, mi, so, do, do, ti, do, la, ti, do, la, so, rather. And again, I'm not, this is a little bit out of my range. It's not important that you sing it exactly, but it's important you understand the melodic gesture and the feeling of it. So, and then, I, then you try to kind of say, well, what would what would what would sign sound nice to follow that? Uh, and they and so so what I came up with is we have this kind of. That kind of like uh, up a step, down a third, up a step, down a third. And I said, okay, well, let me let me kind of keep that going, but change the rhythm. I don't want to just do 16th notes, so I'll go up a step again as an eighth note, and then I'll go down a third, and then I'm just going to kind of go down a scale with eighth to sixteenth, so I can get myself back to, to time, right? So I said, so this is... This right here is me completing the measure. So I go, right? So we have the beginning of the measure. And I complete the measure. Now, I should probably say where you're going is very important. So let me give you my tip for measure three. Measure three, my tip is do a variation on the first measure by starting with the same rhythm but invert the melody. So, like, do it upside down. Instead of going up, go down. You don't have to do this, but this is like, I'm trying to give you the most simple method to kind of come up with a decent melody. So, I'm, I'm shooting to go back to that G, so this is why I'm kind of going down this scale the way I am. But now, when I get to this G, and this is measure three, and measure three, again, is the variation in inversion. So instead of going, like I did, like they gave you, I start by kind of going, I go 
down the arpeggio. Bam, ba, dam. And here, I, I, I want to be aware of the range of the instrument. Now, this is asking for clarinet, and it's written in concert. You know, but it starts here on a B, so I know I know we can, you know, they're not going to take any points off if I go as low as a B, but I don't want to go too much lower than that. Just, I don't want to risk going outside of the range of the instrument and losing some points. Even if the melody is good, it wouldn't fit for that instrument. So after I go down this, uh, do, sol, mi, so do, sol, mi, I'm like, okay. I kind of want to start moving my way back up. So I don't do a complete inversion, but I have that general idea. So let me tell you what my tip is for measure four before we complete measure three. So measure four, write a half cadence, meaning ending, end on five, Roman numeral five of your starting key. So Roman numeral five of my starting key, this is going to be a D major chord I'm going for, right? So I'm going to go for a D major triad and I'm going to do a half cadence. I'm going to make sure that there's a rhythmic pause either with a rest for the second part of measure four or a long note value. So how am I going to get to that? Well, here I'm at B and I want to be going to a D major triad. I'm just going to go up the scale, you know, I'm just going to go C, keeping the same rhythm, right? Same rhythm as that first measure. And then here at measure four, I'm going to recopy the key, sing the, the key signature as well. I'm going to go to a D. Right? And so the D, and that's going to be my, I'm going to my half cadence. And so I go on my D and I'm like, okay, D. And we notice here the rhythm is quarter note, four sixteenth notes. So this is the second measure that they gave us, right, as part of the exam. I want to do a similar rhythmic construction, right? So I want to go quarter. And then here I decided to go. So I take the four sixteenth though. So I go da, and I put in a C sharp, da da di da, and I, get, I don't actually need to write the sharp here. It's in the key signature, so let me just put the F sharp there, and I make it a dotted quarter note. Right. So let me read what my tip was for for measure four, and this is measure four that we're working on right now. Write a half cadence, so I'm, I'm obviously da. The C sharp is a, a, a chromatic lower neighbor tone, upper neighbor, so root chromatic passing uh, neighbor tone, upper neighbor part of the third of the D major triad, right? So this is all essentially a five chord. So write a half cadence. Make sure there's a rhythmic pause, either with a rest or uh, on the second part of measure four, so this is the second part, measure three, or a long note value. So I put a dotted quarter, which is pretty long, especially when we compare measure two, which kind of is the analogy of that, where we kept moving, an F sharp would be a nice pause. Now, my last tip for measure four is make sure to include a pickup at the end of measure four if there was one at the beginning. There is a pickup here, so we're going to want to do a pickup. Now, I'm not adding any of the dynamics or slurs. I'm going to go back at the end and add those in afterwards. So we know that I'm going to want a pickup, just kind of like the same rhythmic pickup. But melodically, I, don't, I, I, don't, I can't do the same one. It uh, wouldn't make sense. I'm going to want to get back to measure five. And in measure five, my tip is, so step, next step. For the second four measure phrase, and I make the executive decision. They say eight to ten measures. I'm going to choose eight. Four measure phrases are the most common. They're how you most easily construct melodies and, and parallel periods and contrasting periods. And I'm going to be going for a parallel period. That's the easiest. Um, and again, if these are some of these words you don't know, go back to my lesson in the playlist. I have everything kind of labeled. So you can jump to the right sections. Uh, and find out about periods construction. But this is why this is grade six uh, on the exam. This is not grade five or four. It's, it's assuming you have a good amount of knowledge at this point about music theory. So in the second measure phrase, go for a parallel period by starting with the exact same melody as measure one for measure five. 
again, you can modify these a little bit, but do your best. So if I want to start and do the exact same melody for measure five as I did for measure one, thereby making it obviously a parallel period, that's what I would have, right? So if I'm here at F sharp, I don't want to go jump down BD. I'm just going to do, I'm going to change the pitch melodic contour, but I'm going to keep the rhythmic character. So I'm just going to go like that to get my pickup into the fifth measure. Then when I get to the sixth measure, use, my tip is, use a variation or scales. You could begin to modulate towards the end of this measure. So here we go. Uh, and, and when we, when we you know, this is where we want to modulate. Don't modulate in the first phrase. Don't modulate in the first four measures. Modulate at the earliest in the sixth measure, maybe in the seventh measure, all right? And when we say we're gonna modulate to the relative minor, we wanna make sure we know what key that is. That is E minor. We're going to E minor. So the first thing you wanna do is note take to yourself and jot down what's the new pitch that's going to tell the ear or the person grading your music theory exam that you're in a new key. And that letter is going to be in a D sharp, which is going to be the raised leading tone in the key of E minor, right? So when we modulate to the relative minor, we're going to E minor, and we need to have some D sharps in our melody. That D sharp is the note that's gonna tell everybody, we're, hello, we're modulating, everything's fine, right? So once we get up to here, I notice what I wanna do is, I, I just kinda do a, a variation. I'm gonna go. There's my D sharp, okay? So I kind of said, I'm just gonna do some, I'm just gonna make up some kind of like, they, they, they like 16th notes, I'm gonna do even more. Haydn loves 16th notes, but it, it's not all straight 16th notes, he breaks it up, otherwise it's too kind of like predictable. So I'm gonna go four 16th notes as a grouping, because he, you know, Haydn does that right there in the, the given, then I'm gonna put in two eighth notes, I'm going to do another series of four 16th notes. And then right here, at the very, very end of this sixth measure, I introduce my D sharp. That's where I'm doing it. And I'm like, aha, that's, that's the clue. But it's not confirmed yet, right? We don't know that without more D sharps, um, you know, it could just be a chromatic neighbor tone like this C sharp was. So we're going to want to make sure that we have, to, to make sure that the modulation is clear, we're going to want to have a sense of what chords can, are going to go underneath it. There's going to need to be more than one D sharp. So here, when we get to measure seven, my tip is modulate to the indicated key by using the new accidentals in the melody. So again, in this case, there's only one new accidental that we really need to use. Uh, you could use a C sharp if you're kind of going up the ascending melodic minor scale. If you're kind of going to be going solati do, you could use that. Uh, but the D sharp is the main, main, main one you want. All right. So we're modulating here, and then finally for measure eight, which is going to happen, let's say around around here, write a perfect authentic cadence, meaning perfect authentic cadence five going to one in your new key, which means we want to have a E minor triad right there, and then we need a five chord feeling, right, a B major triad, somewhere either for the entire measure or at least the second half of the measure, right? So what I came up with is a one chord at the beginning, and I continue the 16th notes, and here I do a, two sets of them, And then right here is where my five chord is really going to be. There's my other D sharp. This one, this one is not a chord tone. This, this one is a, a uh, neighbor tone. And sit tight. I'm going to be almost done with this one, and then we can move on to other questions. Uh, and I can right here. Perfect authentic cadence. Easy peasy. Nothing, nothing too, too, nothing fancy, right? I'm not trying to be fancy. I'm trying to make sure that. I show to the person grading this test 
I understand the concepts of how to write a melody, how to modulate, all the things they're asking for. So if we listen to it, we get... morning uh, that that fulfills the assignment right so it's not meant to be inspirational it's not supposed to be the next greatest melody uh, in the classical world but it does illustrate things uh, and everything they ask for so now to make sure I, I you know always reread the directions because I know that that last part of adding performance directions I haven't done yet so it says continue this opening which was from this B to this D so from here to here, it says continue this opening to form a complete melody. So a complete melody, one that has a cadence is what they're really talking about. For unaccompanied clarinet at concert pitch, it should end with a modulation to the relative minor, which I did, right? So this is obviously a five chord here going to a one chord, and you don't need to write those in. They're not asking you to write in the Roman numerals, but it's what you should be aware of. And it should be between eight and ten measures long. Well, I got eight measures, so I did the minimum. Great, and four measure phrases are normal, so that, that makes a ton of sense. Add performance directions as appropriate and write the complete melody on the stage before. So performance directions. So here they're talking about dynamics, the sforzando, and the slurs. So if we have da da the pickup has as a slur, that means we probably want to find every other place and do that. And so we could do that. And that every time we have those groupings of the two 16th notes, I'm going to put a slur there. Here, we have this sforzano. We know we repeat that uh, where, with, with this kind of quarter 16th. So if we have something like that again, like here, I'm going to put a sforzando. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to slur, um, and then I'm going to slur into the first 16th note, and I'm going to slur the other three. So I'm going to do that. Anytime I have bam, da 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 dum, or bam, yeah, bam, da 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 dum. So this one doesn't have the dum, da 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 dum, either to these, but I might kind of put some similar slurs in there. So Sforzano here, I'm gonna, gonna decide what I'm gonna do here. So dum, da dum, dee. I'm probably going to do that same thing, even though it's not. I'm going to do dum di da da dum di, and the, here the the way I put the stem direction is a little funny. I probably would have to put it down if I if I rethink this here. Put this down so that I can do the so I can do that and that di up da da right so and then da. Da da da, da 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 So I'm kind of like, there's an emphasis on the, the second 16th note based on this here. And I kind of decided, let me just continue that for the whole thing. Um, and then we're going to do something with dynamics, right? Because we have the sforzandos. And we have a forte here. We're going to want to do something else. So here's where we kind of sing it and try to use our imagination, right? So we'll go. So we're going da. Maybe when we repeat it, we kind of do an echo type of thing, and we put a piano here. Do we da right? So, so it's the same thing, but for variation, we we make it piano. And we go do. And we're gonna to get to the K 
cadence, and we have the 16th note, that sounds like a great place for a crescendo, right? So we go. And that's D sharp. It could be like, we can we can have the beginning of the crescendo, right? We can have begin it. Um, and if this was laid out, you would probably put something like crescendo stuff, dum, and you may put the crescendo here, or you could start a little bit earlier. Maybe end on a mezzo forte, or maybe all the way back up to forte. But what you do is you, by, by paying attention to these performance directions as they ask in the directions, you're giving them some dynamics, right? You're putting a mezzo forte, you're putting a piano, you're putting the sforzando, you're, and you're putting in articulation. So articulations, for those of you who are not wind players, this is for a clarinet. So it has to do when you tongue the note, so ta versus ha with just the air. So those types of... Uh, Unique instrumental things is something they're trying to show that you have some information, some knowledge about. So anyways, that's how I, I would answer uh, and have those step-by-step -step tips. Uh, and what I do is once this live video is over, I'm going to go ahead and in the description, I'm going to kind of paste all those tips step-by-step -step so that if anyone wants to go back and look at those and copy them down, you can do that. All right, so let's turn to the chat, and, and it's, it's good to see. We've got, we got 15 people watching right now, which is great. Um, first question, are you doing a full DVD on music theory? Ooh, interesting and intriguing. Well, I probably wouldn't do it as an a old-school DVD in the sense of actual, an actual disc, but a series of videos that can then be distributed in some way. Uh, you know, I, I've certainly thought of that. I have my, my core lessons that are up on YouTube now. Uh, I've been starting to do some of these live video Q and A's. I answer questions that people send them. So I had my Ask Dr. B Music Theory series. Um, there's a couple different areas and things, things in terms of uh, what I've been thinking about. You know, what's next for for Dr. B Music? And uh, one of the things I did with the whole COVID-19 pandemic is I was teaching all my classes. We were meeting in person as normal, and then come March, I had to move everything online. Now, for music theory, it was really easy, because as you all know, I've got all these videos up. So that was easy, but I had music history classes, I had an orchestra I was conducting, I had ear training class, I had a music history class, I, I think I mentioned that already, and that to transition all, to all of those over to online without any time to create the videos and stuff like I have for music theory was a real challenge. I did do one, uh, record one lecture on Franz Liszt, and I posted it on my Patreon page. And I asked people, you have any interest in Dr. B music history? Uh, and, and there were some people who said, yeah, they would, they would be interested in that. And so I might be, be you know, depending on, because at this point, I don't even know what's going to happen in the fall and September for my classes, whether I'm going to be doing things online again or whether I'm going to be back in person. So I might start this summer working on some new kind of series. One of them might be music history. One of them might be your ear training. One of them be, might be introduction to music theory. Because I have some friends who teach introduction to music theory. And, and, you know, just start from like really like the basic, basic, more basic than my lesson one and move a little bit slower uh, to really help people who don't even know how to read music at all. Um, and like I mentioned at the earlier part of this video, maybe going through the, the ABRSM and seeing if there's any of those areas that they cover that I haven't to kind of fill in those blanks. Um, so all of those are things I've been considering about and then to kind of release it on a, uh, some kind of DVD or similar platform is something I've been thinking about. So I haven't, don't know exactly what those plans are, but you know, I, I like, I like reading your comments and your, your questions, and if you have ideas that you think might work, I kind of put them away. I don't always get to respond to everybody, but I do think about it. I do read them, and I do think about them, and sometimes, you know, a year later, you might get your question answered. It was a long wait. My apologies, but I, I, I do read them, and they are, they are important to me. Um, so, so in terms of what's the website, so there's... there's um, so you're obviously here on my YouTube channel, but I have a Patreon uh, page. So if you type on Patreon, and I'm going to just type this in the chat myself, Brellox Music Theory, you should be able to find, find that. Um, Nick, hey, from India. Hey, from the United States. Uh, I'm in the 
I'm about 90 minutes north of New York City, which was like a big virus area. Um, so, but Mid Hudson Valley, which is where I am, 90 minutes north, uh, we're doing we're doing okay. So, hello, ah, hello from Germany. Wonderful, wonderful. I lived in Germany for a year. I lived in Karlsruhe, and then I lived in Cologne. Um, and took some trips to Trier. It was a great year of uh, hanging out. I did it after I finished my undergraduate degree. So in my early 20s, spent a year living in Germany. It was, it was really a great experience. One of, my, one of my most relevant to music theory was spending some time in Trier, which is a kind of in the northern part of Germany, uh, towards the border, near the border with France. So the north, uh, you know, the north, that, that part of Germany. And... Uh, and there's like, here in the United States, like we have all our electrical cables for electricity. Almost all of them are like above ground, hanging on poles and going to houses. So everywhere you look, you can tell it's kind of like 20th century plus, right? In, in terms of time. Whereas in Germany, on most of Germany and Trier in special, all that kind of modern stuff is like underground. And when you walk through Trier, the architecture, it looks like, 17th century like there's castles and stone and things like that and I remember walking through through Trier with some friends and it started to lightly snow and it I got this overwhelming feeling we were starting to talk about Johann Sebastian Bach and I was like Bach could come around the corner at any minute and I wouldn't be shocked because the setting made it feel like oh yeah of course Bach, we're talking about Bach, we're, of course, and the, there's Johann now on his way to get some, some Wiener Schnitzel or something, right? So I, I, love, I have a personal love of, of Germany, so I'm glad that we got some Long Beach, California, all right, West Coast. Uh, Malaysia, very cool, all right. Um, some compliments, hey, Germany will be able to lay out, okay, so from Germany, we got a question, would it be helpful to lay out a form first, including chords, and then filling in notes? Now that's that's from Constantine. That's a great question, Constantine. And, you know, as I was doing this, I was thinking to myself, oh, I should kind of tell you where, where we're going ahead of time. So I think you're right. There would be a lot of value in kind of laying out the form and the chords ahead of time. Um, so if we kind of take the example I just went over and kind of work with that some more, uh, I want to do four measure phrases. It's the most obvious. So we kind of say, okay, we have the pickup. We include that as part of the form. I put a bracket bracket, right? So here's my, my form. One, two, three, four. And then bracket, because you got to include the pickup. Bracket. There's my second four measure phrase. So lay out your form. That makes a ton of sense. And then you can say, well, I, I want to lay out those chords. And I mentioned in my thing, you want to end with a half cadence. So I'm going to, in, in the starting key, right? So the first thing you do is you analyze what they give you. It's almost always going to start on a one chord, right? So we know that that's pretty, pretty, pretty common. Uh, and I said here, the next thing is end on a five. And then I said at the, at the end, we want a perfect authentic cadence. So we know that we can map in the one chord at the end and then this five chord. And again, it can start, it can be the whole measure, it can be the part measure. So to a certain extent, you can map it out, but you don't have to be super strict, right? So if you, let's say you, you put the five chord at the beginning of the measure, and when you get to actually writing in the notes, you decide, oh, maybe I'm, I'm really on a one chord there, and then I go to the five chord. Feel free to modify. Don't feel like when you set up the, the form and the chords that that's a straight jacket and you can't deviate. But it's a good idea to kind of have a framework. So I, I, I do agree with you there. If I were to continue to to do this particular example, um, the reason I didn't get too in depth beyond the analysis of that first chord and where I'm going is, you know, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. I said, let's do an inversion of the thing. So of the, when I said measure three, I said, let's do an inversion of measure one. So I could have mapped in that I'm, that's almost definitely going to be a one chord, and it is, right? And if we were to analyze this part, um, this, you know, the, the G. So there's a couple options on, you know, probably what that is. So if we go. I'm sorry. Now, 
do we change chords here? Probably. We probably might. Maybe it's a maybe it's a, a five chord that has a suspension. Right. So this could be a suspension, or maybe we have two chords in this measure. But let's go with the most simple thing. Let's call it five seven. We call that a suspension, and then resolve. Then we get a little pattern. Escape, you know, escape tone here. Uh, escape tone. We have a little. Uh, actually, it kind of feels like it, this is almost like a double uh, non-chord tone kind of pattern here. The the, uh, the G and the E, and then we're going chord tone, passing tone, and then we go to five. So we're basically going one five seven one five. Super super basic. You can do that. You can also get more sophisticated, but it's not necessary. And then we start the same way, so you could pencil in the one chord. Um, here, uh, this this is like an arpeggio of a four chord, and then it then it changes, so it's almost. So here, this is where I would say it's it's maybe not as useful to be like I'm going to do the exact chords. Here you, you you can, and then you just your melody would change. So if I were if I were let's say if the chord had been there before. Maybe it would have been uh, and then this becomes five of uh, six and it becomes my pivot chord and then this becomes one in my next chord. So maybe I, you know, this would be the tricky part if I had, you know, that would be a little bit unusual for me to come up with ahead of time. Um, so I could come up with something simpler and I could just simply have a melody that's a little bit different, but let's say my, you get something. All right, so this would be five, seven. So you could just have this all before and have a melody that makes a little, a little bit more sense with that. But that's a great, great question uh, in terms of like, how you would do it. And so I think you're right. Uh, it would be helpful to kind of certainly lay out the form and then lay out at least some of the chords, obviously the ones that are at the cadence, so that you know what you're going for. So, so when you're making your melody, you're not just being like, I have no idea what pitch to choose. You kind of have a, a guideline there. So great question. Great question. Ah, uh, oh, Quebec, Canada. Oh, I've been to Quebec. Wonderful, wonderful. The old uh, there's that the old old more historic district that uh, there's parts that look like from Harry Potter Diagon Alley um, and uh, a great uh, classical music reference. I was in Quebec and they have in the summer these firework competition uh, and they have different countries come and do these fireworks over like the waterfall that kind of like this big waterfall and it's beautiful and go renties into the river. Um, and I was there on the weekend that Italy was the competitor. And so we, it happens at night because, you know, it's fireworks. So you have these, these little bleachers set up and you're sitting, you know, on the bleachers looking at the waterfall. It's nighttime. And then they start the firework display. And at one point, it's Italy. So, that, you know, there's got to be some opera. And they, they, they pipe in uh, Luciano Pavarotti singing Nessun Dorma as the fireworks going and I'm just talking about it and I'm getting goosebumps again. It was just like epic music outside with a, like a group of people watching fireworks, beautiful nature, human like ingenuity with fireworks, beautiful music. And I was just like, wow, this is awesome. So glad to have Quebec joining us. Uh, so that's awesome. Ah, South Africa. Great. Uh, Good, yeah, and, and you mentioned watching about uh, watching the earlier videos. This is something that I'm always, I get, I, I have certain con, you know concerns. It's like when people start w watching some of my videos, it's like where do they start? Uh, and it's always tricky because obviously I, I did the all the lessons are in sequence. So lesson one through I think I go up to like 49 or something. Those are all meant to be scaffolded. One builds upon the other step by step. Uh, of course, if you're more advanced than that, you might necessarily might find lessons one through five a little bit boring. 
but what if there's some holes in your in your knowledge in which case you've kind of skipped that you might have a problem uh, which is why it was kind of interesting for, for me to to print out the different levels of 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 the uh, of the ABRSM so for theory grade two they want you to move on to simple time signatures of 2 2 3 2 4 2 and 3 8 so I do talk about this in my, my lessons and grouping the notes and rests within these times so how you would beam and, and do things like that and this is an area and I'm going to go ahead and erase this uh, so make sure you get a good look for all of you who, who want to do that or take a screenshot so beaming rhythm is like one of those areas that I found is is not really covered a lot in music um, and it's something that once you wrap your head around as a musician is super helpful in terms of sight reading and playing the right rhythms and, and reading that music correctly so when they're talking about something like uh, let's see three two let's take three two they're saying half note equals one beat and there's three of them in the measure so if we're going to just that would be a measure right and we could say well here's the subdivision right and so our i should hopefully kind of be like beat one beat two beat three right so you see it like that and then when you start getting into more com complicated things so let's say then you're gonna say okay eighth notes well there's gonna be four of those within a single beat so you're gonna beam all four of them together and then you might have quarter two eighth notes like that and then you might have quarter rest two eighth notes so you would end up beaming it like this so again there's beat one there's beat two there's beat three and so you're on the way that it's notated the way you beam things together and tie things is going to be really important in terms of making it clear to the, to the performer's eye where those beats fall and so so that's something they talk about they talk about triplets triplet note groups with rests then they talk about the extension of the stave to include two ledger lines below and above each stave construction of the minor scale harmonic or melodic at candidates choice but candidates will be expected to know which form they are using so in other words you know do both scales and key signatures of the major keys of a b flat e flat and the minor keys of a e d and their tonic triads reposition degrees number only and intervals of, above the tonic uh, by number only so this is similar to this is a little bit of an overlap um, with with part one so as we kind of go forward and i just kind of jump forward they go into six eight nine eight so they definitely have a, a, um, a scale component they have a rhythmic component and then they have kind of like terms and, and you know things like tempo dynamic articulation marks so knowing the difference between a marcato a tenuto things like that so that's not something i've i've done talking a lot about articulation but like so so a dot on top of a note so if it, you have something like this staccato versus a marcato which is that upside down v uh, so marcato versus the line over the note which would be a tenuto and what all those mean uh, so let's, you know, these aren't, these are not an exhaustive list, but these are examples of what we, what we're going to be talking. So a staccato means that the note is played shortly. Uh, so in general, the rule is whatever the note value of the note, play it as if it was half of that, followed by the other half being a rest. So a staccato is kind of equal to saying, a quarter note staccato is kind of the same as an eighth note with an eighth rest. In addition to that, though, the idea is that the end of the note should kind of feel a little bit like a lift. So, da, so you have this da, and so it's a very, very quick, like, decrescendo uh, in terms of how you end the note. 
And the beginning of the note is, is normal, like how you normally begin and attack a note. So every pitch has an attack, beginning of a note, and a decay, how the note ends. So how the be note begins, how the note ends. So a normal beginning and this kind of like super quick decrescendo, which feels like a da, kind of let it feel like almost like a question mark. The marcato has a more accented beginning and a clipped end. So da, da. So uh, it has like a hard end as well. So as a saxophone player, which is my main instrument, what I would do is I would have an accent with the tongue at the beginning, and then I would take the tongue and I would jam it back on the reed to end the note so that the reed's vibrating, and then I put my tongue on it and the reed stops. So you get a, a da. So it's like, if you look at like volume, so if here's the, the duration, it starts with a, a hard, so this is volume, starts loud, it comes da, so it's like da, that's the accent, duration, and then it just stops, right? It's like da, and maybe even a little bit of a uptick with the, when the tongue closes off, so like that. So that's a marcata, da. And then a tenuto means full length, um, but in different contexts, that, that, that variation changes a little bit. It means to kind of give it a, like a, like it's to make sure that the, the volume does not ebb at all, but kind of like duh, almost pushes forward. So maybe comes up a little bit. So not down a little bit. Maybe the dynamic comes up a little bit. Sometimes people do say it means full length, but in actual performance practice, if you have a bunch of these in a row, you need to put a little space. Otherwise it just sounds like one long note. So if you have like, uh, let's say you had quarter note, two note, quarter note, right? So how do you know that those are four quarter note, two note notes versus a slur? You got to do something to like break them up a little bit. So individually, the two note means make sure you're holding it full length. Uh, and a series of notes that all have a two note, you do need to put like a little bit of a ha 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 little emphasis at the beginning and I'll make a tiny bit of space at the end of the note to show that it's actually a different note and not just one connected. So that's some of the stuff. And so, uh, you know, thank you for those of you who've been watching from lesson one and, uh, and following all the steps. And again, I, you know, I, I love learning new things here. And so I'm going to spend some more time looking at these, these, what they're doing over, over in London, um, to figure out how, how I can do and what I'm doing. Uh, another quick a quick story, I was invited to sit in uh, and evaluate saxophone end of, end of year uh, performances in France a couple of years ago, and it was really great, and I had no idea how the French conservatory system of music went. I had no idea. I, I, I sillily assumed that it was like what did, so I get in there, I got my notebook, I'm ready to go, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to see like 18-year-old, 20-year-old out walks like a six-year-old. I'm like, what's going on? I did not realize that the French conservatory system has a is a separate, detached from, let's say, what in the United States we have is like public school, middle school, elementary school. Everyone goes and they study with that teacher and it can go from age six to like 26. And you study and they have the different levels. And at each level, there's like a list of pieces you have to be able to play before you, you know, and you choose some pieces. There's a required piece and there's a, choose from this list and you got to perform that piece so it's like really structured in terms of the level you need to go from one level to the next level within the French conservatory system and it's it's from ages six through it's like it covers covers that whole spectrum that's not the way we do things in the United States and uh, so I was a little surprised and I remember hearing one student who I was I thought was not doing a good job but I was the guest and I was like I don't want to fail you know I don't want to be the guy who comes over and just fails someone. So I gave him the lowest possible grade that was passing that I could give. Because I was like, man, this person, like, neck strap isn't right. Posture's not right. Isn't playing very well. The actual teacher comes in and says, oh, for this student, uh, what did everyone give him? They're like, this is too high. We will lower everybody's grade from the day so that this one person would fail. And I was like, whoa, that... I was so impressed. I was like, yeah, that's the way you do it. Great inflation, nonsense, any of that stuff. And I was, I was, I was falling victim to it. I was like, ah, 
ask the guy. I'm, the, I'm just, you know, I'm, the, I'm just the guest being invited. But no, you know, I was super impressed that that French Conservatory they had standards, and if a student didn't meet those standards, you do not move on. End of story. And like, and and there was a quality control so that when the the jury panel didn't realize that, like I wasn't, I didn't realize that there would be no problem with me failing someone if they deserved it. I didn't realize that. And when they, when the quality control person came around and said, Oh, no, 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 we, we got to make it, make it right. That was really kind of refreshing. So there's a lot to be learned by studying even something as, as common as music theory, where we're all listening to Bach and we're all listening to these, you know, John Philip Rimbaud and, and these great music theoreticians from history there's still some variation on how it gets implemented and learned, which is worth, worth learning about from the different countries. All right. In Brazil, and the four-part harmonization was life-changing. Oh, awesome. Brazil. Well, you know, I got a love for Brazilian music myself. All, certainly, uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim and the whole, the whole bossa nova thing that happened with jazz as well as people like Cayetano Veloso and Javon, who are, again, older at this point. They're not, they're not the newer people, but there's a whole lineage of just great harmonies and stuff. So we know, we know there's a culture in Brazil of loving the harmonies. So I'm not surprised to hear you loved learning about four-part harmony. That's awesome. Glad to hear it. Uh, if sus2 and sus4 chords would work if applied when part writing? Oh, that's a great question. This is from Gabriel. So let's take a little time and talk about that. So sus2 and sus4. So let's kind of like talk about that for those people who aren't, don't know exactly what that is. So if we take a C major triad, and we say uh, sus4, what that means is that we're suspending, we're taking the four, which is the fourth of the fourth note of the scale. So if C is our root, C, D, E, F, and we're suspending it above the E, we're placing the E. So it would be this E becomes the F. That's our sus four. Um, and the idea of sus two is a little is not quite the same, but 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 similar where the two becomes this the 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 replacement and it replaces the third so it's kind of like it, 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 it it's one's above a note so so here's our C major triad here would be our sus four here would be our sus two and there's a couple different variations of sus two this is one of them so I'm I'm just going to focus on this for the sake the idea is that you're uh, you're replacing, you're pro replacing a note. Um, the sus4 is the most common in terms of traditional harmony because that F then goes down to the E and you resolve it. And just as a reminder, if you had that chord in traditional heart writing, there would be an F somewhere ahead of time that would prepare it by common tone and then it would resolve down by step to an E. Now the sus2 is not um, doesn't quite follow those same functions, right? So the idea, um, what you do have in classical music is what's called a 9-8 suspension, where you have the D and it comes down and resolves to the C, but that doesn't always mean it replaces the E. So there's not 100% analogous, but what happens as music theory progresses is that this sound, this sus4 sound, kind of starts to stand alone and not require the resolution. And the same thing with the sus2 sound. They become this sound. There's like they have a they have a dissonance to them, but but if but through repetition and rhythmic placement, you can make it sound like a tonic triad. This is something I talked about in one of my I, I forget which video it was, whether it was a, a Ask Dr. B about music theory video. I think it was, about how like Alexander Scriabin, when he writes some really dissonant chord like uh, you got something like so it's like a dominant chord with a sharp 11 but if you play that as the first chord you go away from it, you come back to it, you go it starts to feel like a tonic so eventually this sus4 and sus2 they kind of 
kind of detach and don't require a resolution. It, it's very similar, like the major minor seven, which is a which is a dominant chord that becomes a tonic chord, especially like if you're talking about like in jazz with a blues. So you're talking about C seven as your tonic key, and you're playing. It makes it, it makes it sound like a tonic that doesn't need resolution. So that's what you're doing with the sus4 and sus2. So you can certainly do that, that sus4 sound where you have this. And Debussy would use these types of sounds and he would make almost do it like all in parallel. Which is not voice leading, but you could certainly do that. Uh, in a more traditional, weave those into traditional voice leading, where, um, let me see how I would do it. Let's, let's put some new staves on the board here, and just give ourselves an example, because yeah, you can absolutely use this. Now, the thing is, you when you're writing, you you don't want something to stand out like a sore thumb, right? So like if you're using a bunch of triads, triad, 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 traditional voice leading, and then all of a sudden you throw in a, an unresolved sus2 chord or sus4 chord, it's gonna stick out like a sore thumb and it's not gonna really be cohesive, it's not gonna make sense, it's not gonna have a logic, which is so, we go back to what I was talking about with the blues or Alexander Scriabin, they set it up. That, that this is, these are the parameters of our, the harmonic landscape and language. And so you need to be careful that you're not just randomly throwing stuff in, in ways that don't create a, a kind of like a logical, comprehensive, cohesive, comprehensible structure harmonically. But let's say we, we kind of like start with a, like a one chord type of thing. So, so I'm just messing around. So let's let's say we go C. Uh, and here I want C just because it's easy. We do this, and then I'd say I'm going to go to a four chord. Uh, let's see how. Let's say I just keep the G there, right? So here's what I'm going to do that's a little funky, right? So so this would be like a sus2 uh, with the F, so F, C, F, G. You would, you would, you can make almost anything work with good voice leading. And as long as there's resolution at certain points. So if we have... dissonance of the second, it kind of shimmers. So it has a certain beauty. So think of the shimmer like the light on, on water. There's, there's activity, there's a, a dissonance, if you will, but, but it, there's a beauty to it as well. And so I think that's, that's how you would conceive of creating your harmonic landscape that's comprehensible and, and makes sense. So if we go from this... See if we can keep get the other sus chord, and let's go to four chord. Let's keep this C here to be our sus four, um, and put the D here, right? So we do something like that. So this would be our sus four. So this is F G. So you get something like. kind of like a lot of uh, like a pop music style or even like a folk pop folk rock kind of thing like and we come back to C 
So we kind of take our traditional one, four, five progression, but we kind of using these sus four and sus two chords to give it, it's gonna sound more contemporary because again, historically that's just where it is, in part because it's this dissonance, but it's dissonance in a way that that that'll work and give it a shimmer. So that's just like a, a little touch. And let me go back and see if I answered the question at all. Uh, I was wondering if sus two and sus four chords would work if applied in part writing. Yeah, I would say the answer is yes. And this is how I would start to do that. And you could certainly work on seeing and getting things more complicated above and beyond that. But yeah, it could work absolutely. Um, so piano man. Uh, what do I think of using major seven chords as your five instead of the dominant seven chord? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. And something like that, I would start by going to the piano and listening to it and being like, okay, how does it sound, right? Music theory is not what comes first. You know, like the idea of the chicken or the egg, what comes first? The music or the theory? The answer is the music. Music comes first. So what I mean by that is you figure, you use your ear to find something that sounds good. Once you've done that, you then kind of like reverse engineer what's the music theory behind that. And the idea is that there's some people who will try to use the theory first. And they'll say, ah, in theory, this is going to work. But it doesn't. It doesn't work in reality. It works in this imaginary fantasy world that's not connected to the reality of the way human beings hear. And there's how acoustics works, how human psychology works. So you have to be able to deal with that. And the best way is to use your ear and listen. This is why having a developed ear that's refined is important. Why listening to lots of different music. Music from Brazil, Argentina, the United States, Bach contemporary, you know, and listen to it so that you can kind of tell the difference between good and bad music. That's, that's an important skill to develop. Uh, and I know somewhat controversial. So people will be like, whoa, it's all personal opinion. It isn't. There is bad music. I'm a teacher. I have students. They've written bad music. I've had to listen to it. It exists. Uh, they just don't know better. They haven't listened to enough. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the skills uh, to be able to really, nor, nor the inspiration, right? Like if you're super, super inspired, and have this like, you know, like Mozart from a young age was exposed to everything. Yeah, you're going to come up with stuff. You're not necessarily going to need the music theory. But you want to listen to it. So let's see. Can we use a major 7 sonority instead of a dominant 7? So let's just do our regular 1. using the major seven uh, as the five chord, right? So let me just make sure I do that. Major seven chords as your five instead of a dominant seven, right? So let's listen here. Here's, here, here it is first as a, a dominant seven. Now let me, let me just figure how I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I have to do it like, like this here. One, four, five, seven, one. Okay, so that, let me play it again. Listen carefully, use your ear. Now let me do the same progression, but instead use five major seven. Some things more than once. Uh, and I know my voice leading is not good, so uh, I should probably. All right, so that would be better voice. Leading. So, so what's tricky is. When you hear the five major seven, 
for me, it sounds unexpected. And it is. So then you have to decide, is it unexpected like a nice surprise? Or is it unexpected like something nasty you put in your mouth where you're like, ugh, that's a surprise, I didn't expect that. Is it a good surprise or a bad surprise? And I would say, um, I would say it's a bad surprise. It, it doesn't, so what happens is you, you, you get a note that's outside of the key, right? You ought, like in this case of C major, which is what I was doing it, you get a, a sharp, sharp four. So you become, it, it becomes chromatic right off the bat. And there's really no setup for that, right? Um, and if you're like, well, Dr. B, could I maybe set it up in such a way? Well, then it's, then it's probably not a five major seven chord if you're setting it up differently, right? So I'm not saying you couldn't use a G major seven chord and figure out how to make it work. Uh, I'm just saying that it wouldn't function as a five chord then. So it's kind of like the difference between sonority and function. So five is a dominant function. That means it has a certain like kind of gravitational pull. And as soon as you put in that sharp four, you don't have that gravitational pull anymore. So therefore, either it's a major seven chord or it's a dominant chord without a major seven. And you can't have, it's, you can't kind of have both. Keep in mind that sevens, um, sevens of chords kind of naturally want to resolve down by step. But when you introduce the sharp, the sharp, this raised note is going to want to drive up. So it's almost like it's in conflict with each other, right? It's, it's kind of wants to be two different things at the same time. So I don't think it works, but, you know, I... That's my tentative answer on that one. Let me let me play around a little bit more here and see. comes out so so unexpectedly uh, and not unexpected like a surprise birthday party that you didn't see coming that's really fun but like more of like huh um, and I think if we look at the history and say well how come you know Bach didn't really do that Mozart didn't do it Haydn didn't do it you know there's there's really just because they didn't do it I'm not someone who's like a slave to tradition just because someone hasn't done it in the past doesn't doesn't guarantee it's a meaning it's a bad idea. There is a, areas for innovation and something new, but you do got to ask yourself: Well, if they haven't done it, why is it just that they haven't gotten around to that innovation or that idea or figured out the way to do that, or is it that it's just not a good idea? And I think that both both possibilities exist. So it's worth li looking at. If you want to experiment some more, improvise at the piano and just try to throw in a five major seven chord and see if there's a way you can make it work. Um, I played around for a couple minutes, not long at all, but it didn't seem like it was going to work. Improvising is often a good way to come up with new things. And we know Bach was an improviser at the organ. And probably he came up with a lot of his ideas by just being like, well, let me see if I can make it work. Well, how about this permutation? How about this permutation? And see what, what can, you can make work. But use your ear. Uh, and make sure your ear is like has 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 enough breadth and knowledge behind it that you're making a good informed decision. All right, all right. Love from India. Oh yeah, that's great. Actually, it's funny. I was looking at my um, my YouTube analytics, and the majority of my viewers come from the United States, which I guess it's not too surprising. So that's where I'm at, and that's where I'm doing it. Followed by the UK, is my number one, my number two set of fans. And then India is number three in terms of most people who, who uh, are watching my, my, my videos. Now, of course, big population in India, uh, which, which certainly helps. But listen, I'm super thrilled that, it's, uh, that, I'm, that, that you're listening, listening to me all the way from India. And I'm, I'm happy to help and share in whatever way I can. So thank you for listening. Good to have you here. 
any book, another question, uh, any book that you would suggest for functional harmony, which is a little modern, instead of focusing on classical music? You know, I don't have a good name. I don't have a good recommendation for that. And it's a great question. Um, you know, I might, you know, I'm going to make a note of that question. Um, let me see how I'm going to do Okay. Um, modern. I'm just to write that down. So, I haven't been to my office at school, uh, at my college, for two months now. But I get, you know, different publishers will send me books, and I just, all the music theory books I just put on my bookcase. Uh, and I do vaguely remember one, um, they send out the little, the, the representatives, and they try to convince you to, like, change to their book. I remember one of them telling me, oh, well, we use more contemporary examples whenever possible uh, as well. I, I'm going to remember when I go to my office to try to look up that book. Um, and if I find it, I'll, I'll put a, a note in here. But uh, I don't know how, how soon I'll be able to do that. Give me one second. I have a book that I did get uh, recently. And this was recommended from someone who was watching my last Dr. B Music Theory Live. Here's this book, all right? And I've started reading it. It's called Hollywood Harmony. And it, it's dealing with kind of the late romantic, late 19th, 19th century music uh, in terms of harmony and how that is, is commonly used for Hollywood films. And so I, I, started, I started reading it and it seemed like there were some good ideas. There was a few things that seemed like a little bit overly complex or unnecessarily complicated. So it might be a little bit difficult, but this is one of the books, again, called Hollywood Harmony, Musical Wonder and the Sound of Cinema, Cinema by Frank Lehman. And, you know, it's certainly talking about, so they talk about the Neo-Romanian theory. Uh, and I started to, it has a lot to do with voice leading and how you can transform, like, one chord to another chord uh, by, by, by moving things by step, up or down, chromatic or non-chromatic, non and how it can then get you into different keys in a very smooth way that sounds like it flows into another key, but it's like a nice surprise, because you're like, oh, how did I get to this key? And it's, the answer is by this kind of transformational by step, by changing notes within the triad. So, like, as an example, you'll say, like, you know, you got a, a C, C, E, G, um, you know, and if the G goes up to A flat and this E goes down to E flat, now we've got an A flat major triad. So it's all based on triads, but then moving, moving notes by step in different areas to get to different keys that would, that under traditional harmony would take a bit longer in terms of a modulative process, um, but late 19th century, we're talking people like Wagner and Franz Liszt and Richard Strauss. These are people who are, you know, in Claude Debussy, who are using some of these harmonies that the, what Hollywood do, has done is they've basically taken, um, like, the most, uh, I don't want to use, so, how to phrase this. So, a lot of the classical late 19th century composers, they're, they're going to take their time to develop something, to then come up to this climactic moment where this interesting harmony happens and all of a sudden you're shifting from one harmony to another. So, But they set it up. And what Hollywood movies do is they're like, we don't have time for all that stuff. So let's just go to that climactic moment where you have that huge transformation from one key that has this big emotional impact. And let's just focus on that. When done well... It's very exciting and it works, right? They, they pick that, that climactic moment, they focus in, they distill it. They don't waste any time with the buildup. When not done well, it feels cheap, like you didn't earn it. It's like you're just going for the flash and the big payoff without putting in the work that's necessary to make it have meaning. So that's, that's one of the things that with Hollywood film, some, you know, like everything, some of them are excellent and some of them are not as excellent. You know, good craftsmanship, but not good artistry. I know I'm throwing stones. Who am I, right? Anyways, after listening to lots of music, that's, that's, that's been my conclusion. But this is a book that's interesting, that kind of maybe gets you know, a little bit there in terms of expanding the traditional. 
and, and contemporary in the sense that it's del dealing with film music. Uh, and I'll, I'll see if I can look in some of those other theory books, because I know that some of the publishers are starting to try to do that now, to, to get away from just using Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven, and try to use you know, some Beatles songs and some, you know, music that's, you know, still listened to, even if it's not the most contemporary music, but something that's like still on the radio, not just on the classical station. So that's a great question, and, and it would be a great book, uh, and it would be a great book to have. So, great question. Thank you, Tanish. Um, great, great. Moving forward to so some other, other questions here. Um, let me see. We've got, uh, so I want to know the difference between a sus4 triad and a pedal and just broidery embroidery. Uh, okay. I'm not quite sure you mean, what you mean by embroidery, embroidery. So let me focus on the first part of the question. Difference between a sus4 triad and a pedal. Oh, okay. Well, certainly I can answer that. So I guess you were talking about whether, if I were to guess what you're trying to say with the kind of embroidery, is whether it's just like a non-core tone or whether it starts to becoming like a, a, a sound of its own, uh, like a, a standalone chord, where, where, but that gets its own name. So I think the, the short answer, so uh, let's talk about what a pedal tone is. Pedal tone is where you have uh, a note that's, let's say, it's in the chord, and then you'll change chords, and that note is no longer in the chord, but, and then you go to another chord that, ha that has that in it. So, for those of you who have excellent ears, you can go ahead and, uh, put in the chat what, what you think this progression was I just played. I'm in the key of C major. You can write it in terms of Roman numerals or uh, lead sheet symbols, um, or you can simply just tell me, you know, what, what's, what's the, the progression. And it's obviously a pedal in the bass. So C major triad. So jot your answer. Uh, I will step away for one second while you jot your answer to make sure I have everything still plugged in and running correctly. All right, all right. Now let me give you the answer. So it's a C major triad with C in the bass. Then it is a G major triad with a C pedal, F major triad. And here you could say, well, it's in the chords, but it kind of still feels like the pedal and then C major triad. So the real chord where you have the pedal is here. This you could say, like, so if I were to write it with lead sheet symbols, it would look like that. C, G over C, F over C, C. So the pedal, again, this is not a sus4 because we actually still have the B here. So we're going. So for it to be a sus4, I would have to go from. That would be like a sus4 with the C in the bass, but here it's a pedal because that C is not in the chord, uh, and it's and it's not and it doesn't resolve down as a suspension, so it, it doesn't fit any of those categories. So the idea of a, a pedal has that kind of structure to it, and the sus4 and the sus2. The idea is that you're playing them and you're not resolving them. So you're playing them on like a beat one, rhythmically prominent, and you're not resolving it. And so the ear basically says, kind of switches from the expectation of triads. It says, oh, okay, I get it. This is now your structural unit. It's gonna be this more shimmery, slightly dissonant, yet still understandable new construction. I hope I answered that question at least somewhat. Uh, maybe not the best, but at least giving you a, a, an area to start kind of thinking about it. Uh, 20th, 21st, so Gabriel gives a suggestion here. 21st Century Part Writing by J.J. Berthoum is an upcoming book about modern functional harmony. It seems very promising. Ooh, I'll keep my eye out for that as well. That sounds excellent. 
uh, thank you for the answer. <laughs> I like this way, this phrase. I feel that with the rise of bedroom music production, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, I mean, it's so amazing how this has changed. You know, the uh, so when I was 17 years old, my friend rented a four track recorder using like cassette tapes right and that was like the big technology we went to his basement and we he laid down some guitar like uh, he did like he rented a he rented a four track recorder and a 12 string guitar he laid down 12 string guitar strumming he put down a regular guitar thing and i put down some saxophone we we made a four track recording and we were like whoa we're making our own thing the technology has just continued to get substantially better and so i think you're right this rise of bedroom music production in terms of not only the, the recording of it, but the creation of it. Uh, a lot of Indian youngsters want to become producers, and thus they stumble upon your channel for music theory. You know, I, that's exactly what I want. It's exactly what I want. I, I, you know, I think that my, my best experience, you know, the, I'm in education. I'm in, like, traditional academic education. I'm a college professor. It's my full-time job. Uh, I teach classes. Uh, under normal circumstances, it's in person. I grade homework. I touch paper. Uh, it's very traditional, and but I think that with the technology now, there are alternatives that are ter perfectly valid, and that's kind of what I've been trying to do with this YouTube channel: is take the the rigor and the standards of traditional music theory and academia, but translate it into a way that people can kind of learn at their own pace people who maybe either can't afford to go to college or geographically can't get to a place or just have other obligations in their life or who just don't feel comfortable in that type of setting uh, that they got an opportunity and with the technology now yeah just like in audio production um, you can you can kind of you get yourself a laptop you get yourself some some microphones and some a, you know, not the crazy expensive gear, you can be producing really top quality music. And when you're doing that, to have some understanding of the music theory, so that as you're creating it, whether you're programming into the computer or playing it on a keyboard or, or just putting it into, whether it's GarageBand or Logic uh, or, or Pro Tools or whatever you're using um, to create beats or harmonies or chords, uh, that you have a greater array of options to open to you, right? Use your ears. I'm not someone who's gonna say, oh, you're doing something that's not in a textbook, don't do that, that's wrong. If it works and it sounds good, go ahead and use it. This is where how innovation happens. But at a certain point, inspiration usually does not last you an entire song. And so to have all these music theory options of things that have worked for people for hundreds of years, to have them and be like, huh, let me try one chord going to a four chord. See if that works. Or, I know, maybe a six chord here. Or, you know, let me try a Neapolitan six chord. Or an augmented six chord. Let me try, you know, like, and it's not saying guarantee that any of those things will work for your piece as a young Indian producer coming up with something. But you might try it and it might either, one of them might work or it might lead you to an answer that works. And I've always said, you know, I would love to be living in a world where everyone producing popular contemporary music knew all their music theory. Now, whether they chose to use it all or not, I don't care. But, the, but if they had that, that knowledge behind them, then the listeners would follow and they would get accustomed to it. Because if the emotion is there, like it doesn't matter, right? Like whether it's a triad or something more sophisticated, if the emotion is legit, and it works and it makes sense, people will follow. So I, I, you know, I love the, the opportunities that are available. I'm happy to be a part of, uh, in whatever way I can, in terms of helping provide that information for young producers or young arrangers, young composers, uh, whether those be DJs, production people. And, and yeah, thank you very much for saying that. I appreciate that. Uh, that's why I, I kind of ask, and I've had some people say, hey, Dr. B, could you do some more uh, analyses of contemporary music and I've done a few Dr. B music theories where some kind of electronic you know electronica type of pieces and stuff like that and I try to analyze it and say well here's where it's following your traditional harmony structures so here's how it's 
quote-unquote normal, and here's where it deviates. And, and that's really interesting if you're a young producer to say, okay, I want to have some amount of the traditional so that it, it, there's something to kind of like that framework that makes sense that everyone can relate to. And then here's the areas, and this is how much I can do something different, something unusual, to give it a, a sense of something fresh, something new, uh, something even maybe even innovative. So I, I, I do like that idea in terms of things to think, think about how I'm going to spend, be spending my summer month. Uh, I do like the idea of maybe analyzing some of more contemporary music, and pointing out where the music theory is traditional and follows, where it differentiates, and then when it does do something different, to see if there's a new kind of a new rule on how it works and why it works that I could share with you all, so that you can you can use inspiration, but then you have craftsmanship when you kind of get stuck, and it, it happens to every composer, every producer, every every artist. Uh, has a balance of inspiration and craftsmanship, and it's the combination of the two that makes a great artist. Alrighty, aha, I see that some other people have joined in. We've got 24 people watching now, that's wonderful. Uh, voice crossing, ooh, good question, good question. Um, so let me, t let me answer the topic of voice crossing. So, uh, talk about it a little bit in one of my my voice leading lessons on YouTube. So if you, you want to get a little bit more uh, about that, you can certainly go there and, and listen. But let me explain what voice crossing is. I'll explain why it's, uh, it's a, one of those rules that they say, don't break this rule. But even the greats like Johann Sebastian Bach breaks it sometimes, but he does it like it's kind of like, you got to know how to break the rules. So it's a rule. But if you know how to break it, you're fine. I don't know if there's an analogy with, like, you know, your parents. You know, if you know how to break the rule and not get in trouble, you know, there's a rule. It's there for a reason. But if you break it for the right reason, you're, you'll be okay. It's kind of what voice crossing is, right? So the idea of voice crossing would be, um, and let me, let me just do it with two voices, all right? So we have, let's say, uh, a G and a C. And then let's say we go to... A, C, and then let's say they, sh they, they, uh, then, so G, A, B, and this one goes C, C, A, right? So if you can see by the stem direction, so stem down is your alto voice, so G, A, B, C, C, A, right here. This is voice crossing because your, your top melody, which is the stems up, call it our soprano, and your alto, which is stems down, soprano, the rule is soprano is higher than alto, okay? So when you get something where you have the stem here, something like this, where the, the soprano is lower than the alto, that's voice crossing. Now, why does this rule exist? Let me summarize from from my lesson there uh, the idea is that if you're going to follow these different melodies as they're going along it's easier for your ear to be like i'm you know here's the top one here's the bottom one and i kind of can keep track of them as they kind of like flow and, un, and undulate right but and so there's like it's like it helps your ear keep track of which one is which also there's another factor is that the higher one, okay, the higher one is always, not always, I should say normally, the more dominant. And I don't mean, I probably shouldn't use the word dominant because I don't want you to confuse it with, with the function of harmony, but I would say more prominent, which is why most melodies are sung on top of the chords, not the chords on top and the melody on bottom. That's not the norm. It's the other way around because the melody is, should be the most prominent. So they put it in the upper voice on top of the chords. So what happens and why you have that is so that the prominent voice is there and it stays there and you have the, the lower voice and it's easy for your ear to keep them. And you can follow the melody of each one. What happens is when they cross, 
at the moment of crossing, your ear has to kind of decide, do I continue to follow the, this melody as it becomes the lower voice, or do I switch over to the one that's the more prominent voice, right? Because your ear wants to follow the integrity of a melody, and your ear wants to focus in on the most prominent voice. And so when you get, when they start to cross, your ear has a momentary sense of confusion. Do I follow the melody or do I follow the most, the highest pitch? And you can say, well, why don't follow both? But it is a reordering of priorities because something's changed. The melody that was, the melody that was the hot, the most prominent and the melody, as you, if it stays here, right, the soprano, it's the most prominent and it's a melody. And here's a secondary melody. You follow that one. But its status as primary melody and secondary melody, based on its prominence in terms of pitch level, then changes. And so the ear has a certain sense of confusion there. Um, so back in the Middle Ages, there were composers like Leonin and Perrotin. These are French Perrotin. These are French composers. We're talking like 14th century. And they use voice crossing all the time. So if you want to understand, like listen to Perrotin. Uh, uh, there's a piece he wrote based on a, a Latin Gregorian chant, Viterin Omnes. Uh, there's another sederunt, which I think is a section or a part. Um, and it has like four voices, and there's tons of voice crossing. There's a low bass, and then the upper three voices cross all the time. The effect, emotionally, is very different than the kind of idea of no voice crossing Bach rules that we're talking about. Uh, the effect is it feels like this kind of kaleidoscope uh, collage. It's like everything kind of like, it gives it this more floating feeling as opposed to the idea of harmonic progression, step one, one, four, five, one. So the emotional effect is very, very different. Uh, with voice crossing versus no voice crossing. So listen to that if you want to kind of kind of proof of what I'm talking about. So the way that Bach, when he did do voice crossing, it would would be because this the integrity of the melody is so strong. So in this example here, you might say the 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 importance of you might be so important that the sopranos. And depending on how it continues, you could say, wow, yeah, you know, if they, if, if Bach just switched the two voices, you know, it would be a really boring melody for both of them. But by having the voice crossing, it makes both of those melodies really interesting and compelling melodies. That would be how you could break voice leading, uh, that con the, a voice crossing rather, break the, the rules of voice crossing. So that's what it is, why it exists and how you would break it. And if you just disregard it altogether, like Periton, how you get a very, very different effect. Uh, Christian Frankoviak is here. Now this is a name who I actually know both in person and online. So Christian, good, always happy to see your name and, and anything here. Uh, just started reading the Hollywood book, but have you found it mentioned the different function of music in silent versus talking pictures? Do you have other film music book recommendations? Oh, wow. I haven't gotten gotten that far I my sense is that it's really focusing on more contemporary Hollywood stuff so not talking about uh, silent films uh, and the music there that there, there's a whole history and I don't have any books I would have to you know you you probably be as, as well suited as I to go on Amazon or whatever and start kind of looking for books about that um, you know so at the very beginning you basically had live music accompaniment to films so these were people who would actually be in the theater playing an organ in the movie theater and they'd be looking at the screen and basically they'd be improvising and coming up with stuff. Talk about a, an amazing job and what, a, what kind of amazing mu musical skills had to be developed to do that successfully. Then at a certain point they'd say, okay, let's get the sound, the music recorded into the film uh, and have that combined in there. Uh, but you would still have, you wouldn't have dialogue from the actors, you'd have like the subtitles and be like, but you would have the music put in there as like a whole separate track uh, that's recorded separately. Um, 
so there's an evolution there. And it's, it's interesting, and I don't know a ton about it, and I don't have any good recommendations for you, so I'm, my apologies on that. All right, in, the keeping, in keeping with the theme of books, have you written a book before, or is that something you would get involved with in the future? So uh, I, I'm always flattered when people ask me that. I haven't written a book. I absolutely would consider writing a book. It's really a matter of uh, figuring out the time and how to do that, like figuring out the right time to do that. Uh, one suggestion that someone gave me that I think is a good one, and I just haven't done it yet, is I have all these videos. You know, pay someone to just basically transcribe everything I'm saying and use that as the as the like the, the preliminary rough rough roughest of drafts of my music my first music theory book uh, and I think that's how I would do it um, and then kind of coming up with the examples and things like that uh, it's something I'm interested in doing I guess you, you when we say this is something for me and I'm sure you all have kind of the same there's a ton of things I'm interested in doing so many that it's not possible for me to do all of them. And certainly not all of them at the same time. So uh, my, right now, my, my, I'm, I want to do a music theory book. And I think, I think maybe, you know, I, I thank you for asking the question because it, it's getting the wheels turning. What I've been doing, so one of my other big projects was this music of the Gilded Age, late 19th century music. Uh, in the historic mansions where I was, do so I've been doing some uh, film documentary series on that. So I've done a lot of research and spent a lot of time working on that. That's been a, a little bit more of a priority than writing a music theory book. Well, one of the things I did with, with all this whole virus is I had some of my former students who were just gigging musicians and, and all of a sudden they had no gigs. And so, uh, I had been talking with them prior to about like, oh, you know, I've got all this research I did at the New York Public Library, and I need someone to take all this music that I took pictures of and put it into music notation software like Finale. And so what I did is I said, hey, you can't do, you can't be doing the gigs you normally do. I've always needed someone to do this work of putting this stuff into Finale for me. Why not? Why don't I pay you to do that? You know, you need, you don't have the work now. You got free time. I need it done. I, I still have my job. Let's make it happen. Uh, and so maybe well, well, so many people are still um, kind of stuck at home, <laughs> producing in their bedroom uh, the, their music and they're studying their music theory. This might be a good time for me to actually do that and contact one of the one of the, my former students or someone who knows my my style and my my has heard it all before and knows music theory, and just say, hey. Start transcribing, put it all onto like a Microsoft Word document. Let's get this book started. Um, you know that that's that's not a bad idea. I think I might I might do that uh, and put that bump that up and to at least get that preliminary stages up. Because I've I've said all this stuff. It's on the record. So once I have it written out for me, it's going to be a lot easier for me to then polish it, put it into a a, a really comprehensive book setting. So I'm going to do that. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion. And thank you for that question, I should say. Uh, you can easily create courses and put them on websites like uh, uh, Udemy, Skillshare, Coursera, etc. A simple search like Music Theory for EDM on YouTube will show you how hungry people are. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I actually had a former student of mine contact me about creating some stuff. This was like last year, and I was in the midst of doing a bunch of other research. Uh, I just didn't didn't have the time to do both. So there is like there is a thirst out there, and I think it's wonderful. Uh, and I think there's a lot I could do um, to 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 take advantage of that. And it's just a matter of of finding the right time and, to, and and striking and just doing it. So I really appreciate you all. I think this is probably a good good point to wrap it up. We've been at this for about uh, an hour and forty five minutes. Uh, which is always a nice stretch. It's longer than your average class. We've covered some really interesting things. I've gotten some great feedback from you. I hope you've uh, got a lot of great feedback and information from me. It's the summer. I'm hoping I'm going to be able to, to you know, find the time to be doing more of these, both these kind of live Q&As where, where we can kind of ask questions and go in whatever direction, as well as some kind of prepared ones of topics that I want to be talking about Chances are I'm going to be spending 
I'll probably do the live Q&As and probably be spending most of my prepare time trying to figure out what I'm going to do for classes in the fall. So perhaps you'll see some uh, music history or some ear training videos come your way. So make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you've clicked on the, the bell so that you get notifications. And uh, maybe I'll see you next Saturday if my, my schedule is free and your schedule is free. Uh, let's see what we can do. And maybe we can meet up again a week from today and talk some more music theory. So until then, go have some fun with some music. Improvise at the piano. See if you can make five major seven chords work. See if you can brush up on some of the things. Take a look at, at the Royal Academy of Music website uh, testing agency that we talked about. Uh, just go, go have some fun with music until I see you next time. That's all for now. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.